speak on the Capitol Theater. I'm really ignorant on the issues, the specifics of that uh, particular situation. What I would say in a more philosophical way, even though I respect the opinions that uh, were articulated by Mr. Dumas and, uh, and uh, Chris Del Maroney, very frankly, this community is starved for revenue. That's a no-brainer. Everyone knows that. When you have nothing in place in a particular community, and I don't mean to say the city of Flint offers nothing. What I'm saying is when you are in a static situation or actually losing tax revenue because you have business decline and businesses that uh, either close or leave the community, you have to take certain measures incentives to bring and grow new business. And what do you do to do that? The greatest incentive are tax incentives. And it is a foolish, or I will say, very inappropriate argument to suggest by creating incentives for business to come to our community that that somehow dishonors or discredits the situation with residents in this community. I am the single biggest proponent of no further tax increases for the residents of this community. When you add the skyrocketing water bills over the last couple years and add that to the supposedly depreciating property tax values that we pay, I would maintain we are actually paying a greater cost to our municipal community and add, as uh, Mr. Del Maroney mentioned, you add the street light and garbage assessments and any other assessments that come from the EFM that may be coming down the road when all you're interested in is just gathering tax revenue. In other words, costs continue to climb for the residents and businesses of a community and services continue to get diminished. What do you think the end result is going to be? It's not going to be a positive one, but to attract those businesses, you offer. In fact, I'm not going to presume, and I don't want to speak about who's running for what office, but let's just say hypothetically I was a voice on this body. I can tell you there'll be no bigger proponent for the most massive property tax abatements that we can offer to attract business. And why do we do it? Not because we want to stick it to pro uh, homeowners or rub it in their face. It's because what we will do is hopefully, with a contract, an implicit or explicit contract with those businesses <coughs> that promise to bring employees and a workforce and people that will spend money and either live in our community or if they live in the out county or outside the community, at least we will gather, we will gather that 1% ta uh, income tax revenue or that half percent income tax revenue. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's a no-brainer. What you get is if you don't attract the businesses, you don't have anything. You have zero. If you bring the business in, a specific employer, whether he has 50 employees, 100 employees, or whatever, you, get, you gather revenue in the form of income tax revenue. So you have something rather than have nothing. So the idea of playing, it's just like I never uh, appreciated those, whether purposely or, or, or from their own ignorance or their own mistake, play rich against poor, you know, big business against the little guy, black against white. We got to be smarter than that in this community. We can't sit there and play one group off of another. I will say there is one person or one group I have a problem with because we've been disenfranchised and the sooner they transition out of here and prove and allow the democratic process to take hold. But, and I'll back up, I'm obviously talking about the state and the EFM. Whatever gains or uh, uh, value that they provided is probably past due. 
But the challenge will be on you. You are those who choose to run for re-election, or in three cases I see, won't have an opponent. The challenge is for the city council and the a chief executive, should he retain or, or be uh, provided uh, the, uh, the authority that he once had, the challenge to Flint city government is to be wholly different, wholly different than it ever was, to really, really be engaged in this community. And as some had suggested a while ago, get past this, excuse me, I'm gonna swear a little bit, this damn play of politics, race, and, and, and uh, poor, and rich, and all these diversions that set this community backward. I am telling you, if you don't understand the value in this community at this time in history of doing everything you can to grow tax revenue, bring new business in, not just talk about it, but actually take the most aggressive steps you can to bring business in. And the way you do that, among others, among the other things that we won't cover in this sort of hearing, from crime to blight and other issues that, that excuse me, make this community more adverse to attracting business, you provide the economic incentives. And all of you, I don't care what district you're from, whether you're representing the north end of Flint or the uh, west end of Flint or the south end of Flint or the center of Flint, you're going to be way off the beam. You're going to be making a huge mistake if you don't understand the value of attracting business and bringing employers with employees to hopefully provide some revenue. Take the baby steps first and move aggressively forward. And there are other ways that we can cut our costs without diminishing services, but we have to provide basic services and make people feel safe in this community or we're not going to move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council in this public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? If you'd like to address the City Council, just please come to the mic and give us your name and, and you have 10 minutes to address the City Council. Good evening. Good evening, good evening, City Council. My name is Lawrence Miller, 2314. Radcliffe Avenue in the city of Flint. I'm here today because, um, you know, I know we are, you know, we're paying pretty high property taxes where we are. We don't have no city council uh, wanting to represent us. And then um, I feel that the city of Flint police, their response time was very, very negative. And when they did get there, we had some uh, incident where someone was looking through my patio window. My wife saw it and she took out running. I, um, when the Flint City did come, then the officer didn't take a report. They didn't get out the car or anything. They asked me maybe two questions, three questions, and then they disappeared. And I feel that if my family is in jeopardy, I feel that one of the officers should have made a report. I think that one of the officers should have gotten out of his vehicle and did a search. None of that ever occurred. And being a taxpaying and a law-abiding citizen, I could have taken matters into my own hands, but I didn't. You know, I called 911. Again, when they got there, it wasn't nothing. I just wanted to just mention to you, this is a public hearing on the, right, tax, tax, abatement. On the tax abatement. Right, I, I'm, a, I'm aware of that, okay. sir. Right. And I just wanted, uh, and I came in late, and I do apologize for that. But um, like I stated, um, if we're paying taxes over there, I feel that we should have somebody to represent us, someone I could have taken this problem to and not wasted you guys' time. And I feel that this is an important issue. When you call 911 and let them know that someone is looking in your window, and they, when they get there, they don't make a report, and then they just drive off. I just pray that, you know, it don't be a second incident. It could be any of us. It could be your home, it could be one of the, the, the ladies or anything. You know, I just, hopefully, 
this will be, uh, you know, somebody to handle this issue and let them know that, you know, that's an emergency. My three-year-old son was just as frightened as his mom was. Again, I don't mean to take up your time, but I just wanted to address this issue on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to address the City Council on this public hearing? This public hearing is closed. Next public hearing, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, Mr. President. The second public hearing relates to the same property located at 140 East 2nd Street. It's the obsolete property rehabilitation exemption certificate for the Jerusalem Capitol Theater building. And I believe Glenda has the presentation at this time. Okay. Hi, my I'm name not. is Glenda Dunlap and I'm a program manager with the Department of Community and Economic Development. The first public hearing was the first step in a business owner located within an obsolete property rehab district applying for a tax exemption for an obsolete property. That public hearing was held. Once the district is established, the owner of property located within that district can apply with the city clerk's office for an exemption of property that is proposed to be rehabbed within that district. The length of time for the exemption is 12 years. The property located within this district is the Capitol Theater, and we have an owner here, um, representative of the owner here, and he'd like to give some information <coughs> about the project. But we have Troy Farah here. Before she leaves, I do have a question. Go okay. Ahead. Glenda, um, as, as we talk about the districts, just to make sure that we're clear on, on what is happening with the obsolete district. The district is created. Uh, this body does not have any power to uh, approve nor deny it. Right. Should these public hearings run concurrent, be it that if an applicant is applying for a district that, that really does not exist or has the emergency manager already made this a district prior to starting this public hearing? No, they can run concurrently. We had the public hearing for the district, and like you guys said, I think it was Councilman Freeman who said that you can't take any action here. But after this, the emergency manager will take action. He will approve the district first, and afterwards he will consider applic the application for the exemption. So if they go concurrently like that, one just has to be um, approved before the other. And normally you would be able to tell because they have subsequent numbers after it. No, normally these, uh, Sheldon, just the fact, normally these would be done by resolution and we would either vote them up or vote them down. Is that right? In, in Glenda, you, your office would prepare the resolution. Is right, that we would prepare those, or those resolutions. But even if they came to the council, we could do it concurrently then. How it would happen at that point is that you would have the uh, public hearing for establishment of the district, you guys would take action on it, and then we would have the public hearing for this. Uh, it's just going to be done by the emergency manager. No, no, I understand that, but I want to I want to make sure that the, the community understands this because okay. running these concurrent when the emergency manager is not even here to hear the argument or the uh, public um, uh, input to right. this, it seems as, that shouldn't be concurrent in this fashion because this is a new system that we all are now <coughs> experiencing. And um, I just want to make it point out that I think it's a foregone conclusion that the emergency manager has already made his uh, opinion uh, and approval known prior to even hearing the input from the public. Okay. But also, um, usually with the obsolete districts, usually that tax abatement was provided uh, was a state tax abatement, more so than a local one. Or